Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. We're here in the Las Vegas Hills Inside Medicine studio with the Dean of the Roseman University College of Medicine, Dr. Mark Penn. Welcome to the studio, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Doug. It's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on at Roseman University. Gosh, this university came out of nowhere, and now all of a sudden you've got all these great programs. You're building a medical school. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, thank you for that question, because I think part of this is helping us to get the message out about the, the good things that are happening at Roseman. Uh, the first thing that I want people to understand is that Roseman was actually born here in Nevada, in southern Nevada, in Henderson. And uh, as a result of that birth, it grew out uh, from a college of pharmacy, and they added nursing, a nursing college to follow that, and then an MBA program, as well as an orthodontic dental residency program. And those are all the programs that are in Henderson. They exist today. Um, a few years after they were existing here, they then uh, went up and did an outreach up into South Jordan, Utah. So they have a campus up in South Jordan. And up on South Jordan is where they uh, started a college of pharmacy where there's great need. One of the, the issues about Roseman is that just like uh, going up into to Utah, here in Nevada, they looked at what the need was, and they saw that there's a great need for pharmacists at that time. Uh, and so they started College of Pharmacy also up in Utah. They added nursing, and then they also added a DMD uh, dental program, which is a, uh, uh, say, a professional program for dentists. And so uh, they've been very successful programs. So the first class of the dental program just graduated this past June, and uh, we're just very pleased to know that all 64 students that started graduated. So we've got about 1,500 students uh, across both campuses. Uh, we have about 500, uh, uh, say, faculty and staff and administrators that are working through uh, the process as well. Uh, so a lot of things are going on at, uh, at uh, Roseman University. You know, it's, it began and it continues to grow. And, and when you talk about beginning in 1999 and where we are today in just a short period of time, pretty phenomenal growth. And approximately uh, what would be about five or six years ago, there was a desire to create this College of Medicine that we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, they began that process, and so here we are today. That's huge. And a lot of people don't equate um, <laughs> Southern Nevada with medical education. And here we've got an amazing institution born out of Henderson, out of all places. And so when they expanded into Utah, I imagine it was probably a little bit awkward because I believe they started up there as the University of Southern Nevada in Utah, kind of like Miami University in Ohio, or where I went to college, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where people go, what? <laughs> so what, what made the change of the name? And tell us, where did the Roseman name come from? Yeah, the, I think that you're absolutely right. I think when you go into another state and you call yourself a different state, it doesn't always work well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there was some feedback. I, that predated me. But what was really kind of fun about this is that the Board of Trustees at Roseman University uh, sat back and looked at all the landscape and began to discuss uh, what should we name this university? Should we keep doing what we're doing or think about naming it something else? And so they landed on Roseman, which is a combination of two of the founders, uh, say, names. And so there's Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Kaufman. Dr. Rosenberg was the first president and now is the president emeritus of Roseman University. And Dr. Renee Kaufman is the current president. So they took the man and they took the rose and they put them together and got rose man. Kind of like Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you join the team? And you didn't come out here initially to be the dean of the College of Medicine. You came out as the chancellor, I believe. And when did that happen? And how did the transformation go from being the chancellor to becoming the dean? Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. Yes, I was in Ohio for uh, my career, basically, and then I saw the opportunity to come to, to Roseman, and um, I basically was selected and very fortunate to be uh, granted the opportunity to be the chancellor of, of that campus up in Utah called South Jordan. Uh, that happened in July of 2012, and so from that point forward, I began to just help that uh, campus continue to grow, uh, helped uh, during the time when we st were just beginning the dental program. Uh, already had an existing pharmacy and nursing program, and as, as I said, it continues to grow. What happened then as we began to make the decision as a university to move forward with a college of medicine, uh, Dr. Renee Kaufman, who was president at that time, asked me if I would be willing to serve as the uh, founding dean, and I was very pleased to accept that uh, position. So when I started in April of 2014, so I've been at this uh, job for a little under two years now. 
That's that's amazing. So you moved from Ohio that's correct. to Utah. Yes. And then Utah to Las Vegas. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what's it like, you know, I grew up uh, just across the border in Pennsylvania and uh, it's a little bit of a shocker the first time that you come out here and experience this heat. But so what was it like moving from first from Ohio to Utah? What was the, the biggest thing that set you back and you didn't expect? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I don't, I would not consider anything set me back. I, I just had a lot of people concerned that I was going to be leaving the area in Ohio because I uh, had built a, a good say reputation and done a lot of good things there. And I was just uh, looking to continue to work with a, a great organization to continue to move forward because my background has always been one that can grow things and can start them well and to create great foundations. So as I was looking for this opportunity and I began to, to look at Roseman and I flew right into, uh, you know, to Utah, that was one of my first flights. Um, I saw the mountains. That was the biggest surprise for me. And just looking at the, it's kind of like the bowl they would call because the mountains were all surrounding an area that made it look like a bowl. Uh, but they were gorgeous. You know, they're beautiful. And uh, during that time of the year, and uh, the things that I noticed immediately were number one was low humidity, <laughs> very low yes. humidity. It was not uh, very hot at that time when I was uh, doing my first uh, visits uh, to Utah. At that time, I also came down into Las Vegas because the president asked me to also meet with those that were down in Las Vegas. And so I went both places uh, so I could see. And flying into uh, Nevada, it was the same thing as I was visiting in 2011, uh, basically looking at the mountains and just looking at. And I was, I was really surprised as I looked down, I didn't see a lot of green, <laughs> <laughs> which is what we saw a lot in Ohio. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so that was just one of the things that I, I noticed. And as we began to work through this, we made the decision, um, obviously, when President Kaufman asked me to, to join, I did. Uh, I say uh, uh, President Rosenberg at first asked me to do so, and I did. And uh, very grateful to be in uh, Utah because I thought it was a great place to, to start the movement from the Midwest into the West because I'd never really lived out here for very long. Uh, the Utah weather was just great. Of course, you know, you get the snow and the ice, very similar to Ohio. Mm -hmm. Once we then moved down here into Las Vegas, <clears throat> we noticed, of course, the heat. Uh, you know, <laughs> Welcome uh, to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I tell people now is, is that, you know, it's, it's been a great move for us. We really love it here, again, because of low, getting to the, the weather things, the low humidity, and you don't have the ice conditions that you might get back in Ohio and so forth. But um, what we've really grown to love besides those things is uh, we've really grown to love the people here. First of all, within Roseman University, but outside in our local community and what we're finding as in, in, in particular where we have selected to put our, our campuses in both Henderson as well as in Summerlin, the part of Las Vegas, we're just finding that there's more to Las Vegas than just what we had been told by other people. You know, a lot of people would talk about the Strip, which is wonderful for many people that do tourism and so forth. But uh, Las Vegas offers so many other things, and that's been the one thing that I've learned as I've transitioned down here. Yeah. Do you miss anything from Ohio? You know, being from the, the Midwest, it, it, the people are amazing. It's just, uh, but what, what do you miss from Ohio besides shoveling snow? Well, I would probably say the biggest thing that my wife and I both would say would be our children and our grandchildren. You know, we, uh, we have one grandchild who is, so I can be seen. Okay. Uh, we have one grandchild in Ohio, and we have uh, two children that are in Ohio. We have one, our, one of our children with uh, his wife and two of our grandchildren in California, so we're a little bit ah, closer to them. You bet. And then uh, our, we recently had one of our sons that has moved out here, and we're hoping that he'll want to stay out here and, and uh, find a job and do things like that. So he's getting married in the near future. So I don't miss a lot of things from Ohio, except I have great memories. Um, yeah. You know, I started to practice there, um, you know, did all my, um, say, undergraduate training and things like that at medical school and um, just the upbringing was there and just the memories are there with my family. So, uh, you know, they're great memories, but we're also glad to be here without a question. Yeah, I find as soon as people make it out of the Midwest or out of the <laughs> East Coast, they typically don't turn back. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't realize that the, the West Coast in 330 days of sunshine existed anywhere on Earth. Right. So tell us, uh, you built the foundation of the College of Medicine on values <laughs> and a value statement. Uh, Scott, if you could bring that up, let's take a look at that. And uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Penn, if you could kind of talk through that, it, and it's important. Not a lot of organizations have a value statement, and this really speaks volumes. 
Well, thank you. This one is uh, probably one of the most important things that uh, is, is important to me, and as we're moving forward, it is a tremendous foundation for what we're doing. It's a building block. Uh, I come from a farming background, and so one of the issues is is that what you want to do is is make sure that you do your planning well. Uh, you have to make sure that you create that foundation to grow the crops and do the other things that you need to do. So you know, make sure the soil's ready, make sure you have the right seed, make sure that you fertilize, um, you cultivate, and all those kind of things, and then you basically grow your crops. In a sense, it's the same thing here with the College of Medicine. You have to have values that really speak to how you're wanting to build what you want to build. And what I've said to people as I go around this valley, which is very important, is, is that the people should be at the center. And so you'll see the word patience. Uh, people are so important to me. Uh, as a background, I'm a family physician. And so as a family physician, uh, I have always valued uh, my uh, relationship with individual people as well as the families as well as the communities that they reside in. So the values are very important from a perspective that we want to keep the patients in the middle of everything that we think about. And so when we're building our educational program, which we're doing right now, the educational program, and we're building our research and we're building our patient care services that will serve this community, the patients are in the center of all of our thoughts. So we are beginning to say, uh, how will that influence Mrs. Jones or, or Mr. Whoever? It doesn't matter. Just pick whoever that might be. But the patients are in the center, and we say, what's the relevance of this particular research, this partic particular piece of education that we're trying to teach, or the patient care? How do we make it quality for those individuals? So when you look at the values, there's eight of them there. You can see in the center the word patients, which I said is the center focus. I'm going to just highlight a few of those just because of, of time, but competence is obviously a very important thing we, we want in all of our healthcare professionals, not just only physicians. But the uh, medical profession has very high level standards for doing things well. Um, we want to do that here as well in what we're doing at Roseman. Now, Roseman has a very high level standard in its educational model, which is one of the reasons why I came here. And I believe that we're going to have highly competent individuals that we graduate from our program. See things like compassion, integrity, diversity. Obviously, the diversity of our community is very important. And we right now are putting some things together to respond to the diversity of our community and saying, how can we, in a sense, find people from diverse backgrounds to work for us and work with us, as well as, say, diversify the admissions for the students that come in so we can make sure that we have a diversified uh, student body that will eventually help to meet some of the diversity issues within our community. That's very important. Respect is very important because of the issue of just how we treat one another within our college, but throughout the colleges of Roseman, but across the spectrum of everything that we touch. We want to be very respectful to people, to community, to organizations as we move forward. The others you'll see there, I um, want to highlight just two other real quickly. One is community. Community is so important in a value because in, in our opinion, at least the way I'm building this College of Medicine with others, it's a team effort is that we're building this around community. It's the integration, the collaboration, the understanding of our community before we build, but also building it as we go along together. But we need to do it together, and that's very important. And the last one that you see as discovery, what was fun for me is, is that as I was putting this together, I didn't realize that the discovery word was also the name of the, the road that the Engelstadt Cancer Research Building was built on called Discovery Drive. And the discovery obviously means things that have to do with scholarship and research, which are so important to en enhancing patient care outcomes. Yeah, thank you for calling out the discovery. I was just going to do that. And let's let's pause on that. Let's talk about the uh, the assets that you acquired up there at the Nevada Cancer Institute uh, property. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, you scored the golden gem of the desert. Uh, I don't think there's a nicer set of assets that exist in Las Vegas. So first and foremost, kudos. That was a great acquisition. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. First, you got the Engelstad building, and then later on, you moved on to pick up the flagship building. Was that planned from the get-go, or did you stumble upon the ability to acquire the second set of assets? Well, wonderful questions. I think that, uh, well, f what I would say about the Engelstadt building that we were able to acquire as our initial building, a lot of those conversations predated me. Um, obviously, there, was, uh, there were difficulties that the Nevada Cancer Institute was going through, 
Uh, it was very painful, obviously, and as uh, we all remember that know about the story, know that uh, it was uh, one of those that was very, very hard for a lot of people here. Uh, through that process of uh, working with the Nevada Cancer Institute Foundation, we were able to acquire uh, that particular building and some of the other surrounding land, which was also very, very, very helpful to us. As we were moving forward, uh, probably about, I'm, I'm thinking it's about six or seven months or so ago, we were able to acquire the second building. When you look at the campus footprint, you know, you look at that area, you just say, that's a wonderful place to build a campus, you know, and whether you build it as a, uh, say, a medical school campus or you build more buildings for the university to expand the healthcare professions. Wonderful opportunities there. And so what happened was is that that property of the flagship building became available to us. Um, it was available to others as well. But as we were doing the negotiations, um, what we had understood, there were some other people that had the, uh, the facilities and basically were able to work through that and acquire them. And once we were able to acquire them, uh, basically now we have the two buildings. The, the Engelstadt building has about 184,000 square feet. Um, the flagship building, the second acquisition building, has about 137,000 or so. So collectively a little over 320,000 square feet. And uh, we've also acquired, uh, if, if just for the viewers, basically uh, we're talking about over uh, 215 in South Town Center and Twain uh, and Wallapai, kind of in that area is the, kind of where it's nestled down. And uh, we've acquired about, uh, I think it's about 11 or 12 acres that are between the flagship building and Wallapai. So we have room to grow there as far as building more things. And we're talking about uh, developing a campus master plan as we're growing because, uh, you know, there's great need here in a lot of different uh, professions, not only in medicine, as I said, but uh, Roseman is looking at that as an option. Uh, that whole area is wonderful. Um, uh, I love it because it doesn't take long to walk from one building to the other. When I was going to Ohio State University, you'd had to get on buses to go across or you'd have to travel long space. But uh, it's a great, great facilities that we have. It's been amazing just watching the growth of <clears throat> Roseman. Um, the acquisition of this set of assets really created a footprint in Southern Nevada. Obviously, it's something that gives you, the, uh, as a private institution, mm -hmm. the ability, the flexibility, and the entrepreneurial way of getting things done. Uh, you've played that to your advantage. Uh, and, and looking at this campus, it's amazing. When you bought the buildings, what were some of the assets that were in the buildings? Because a lot of people don't realize what was left behind. Uh, from the Cancer Institute and the fact that they just they still live here and that they're now owned by Roseman. That's mm -hmm. uh, tremendous. So tell us a little bit about those assets. Well, great uh, question on that because uh, uh, that was one of the things that stunned me in a very positive way is, is that when you looked at not only the building and how well built that was, I mean, it was just a phenomenal asset, as you say, for the community. You take that building and where it was when we first acquired it, the first and second floors, understand it's three floors, and then it has a basement. But the first two floors are completely built out for doing bench research. So all the benches are there. We have a lot of equipment, you know, that, that's, that came along with it as well. So uh, we have equipment ready for researchers that we're going to be hiring in the future, the current ones that we have, but also for those in the future. So a lot of that equipment is still there in the building on those first two floors. So it's basically walk in and let's kind of set up our lab kind of a thing. There are 24 major labs within that building. There's 12 on the first floor, 12 on the second floor. Um, the third floor, just to give you an example, and the, and the basement do not have anything from a perspective of they're completely what we call shelled out, and that means nothing is there, nothing's built out. But that's where we're going to be building out this, this year our educational programming. We'll be putting an anatomy lab, for example, down in the, the basement of that building, and then on the third floor, we'll be building our theater and the round, uh, say, lecture halls, basically. So acquiring all these assets, what did that do to accelerate your growth plans? Obviously, uh, when you're assembling a big plan and you run across the biggest piece of it already mm -hmm. done and you're mm -hmm. walking in and unpacking boxes, did that accelerate your plan? And how did you pivot or adjust to accommodate this newfound set of assets? Well, I think one of the things that you do when you think about building a medical school, you know, it, it, it's not cheap, and there's a lot of costs involved all over the place. And one of the major ones, as you're mentioning, is in the facilities that you need to either build yourself 
or that you buy something and you, you know, basically renovate in a sense to meet your need. Um, in this case, we're very fortunate as we've been talking about getting these facilities. And quite frankly, our timeline didn't change from when we were starting. Just basically it stayed the same, but it basically has enabled us to continue to move forward more quickly than what we might have thought we might might have done had we not had those assets. Because if we didn't have those right now, we'd have to be sitting back and talking about how do we raise the money to build those assets. Sure. So the goal now is is to raise money to help build out some of those building spaces, and it's a whole lot less costly to do so. So I would say we're still on the same timeline, but it really is a phenomenal part of, of building a medical school. When you're starting a medical school, there's a lot of different costs. The facilities are one, but then you have to hire people, you know, and then getting the people first to to be the team that's going to help to establish your medical school are the critical piece that I believe you have to have at first. And then the facilities, the fact that we have the facilities is great because part of it is it's nice to recruit people too because sure. they can see the home. They can see the vision. They can walk up to the third floor and look at what this is going to be. What is it going to look like? You know, we've got some renderings that we're, we've already created with architects. So there's a lot of uh, great things about having the facilities um, and people from the outside, when they come, they're just really, really just so pleased with what they see, you know, from the, the perspective of when how well built they are. have been building up the dream team. Scott, when you get a moment, if you want to put up uh, the image of the staff that Dr. Penn has assembled, uh, you know, it's you've put together a heck of a team there. Uh, did the assets, did it help you sell the vision? Uh, because I can only imagine walking in and seeing these great buildings and all of the artwork and everything that's there. It's ready to go. Well, thank you for saying that. I, you know, about the dream team. But <laughs> I appreciate that. That's how, you know, I would say that this is an outstanding team that uh, that has followed me and is basically, uh, you know, when you're a leader, if you don't have people that follow you, you're not really a true leader, right? <laughs> um, but in this case, um, I've been very fortunate. Uh, people from all over the country and and many people that are from here that we've been able to keep in this area, which I've been very pleased about because. My focus in hiring has been let's focus on the local people, sure. the people that are qualified, and then we go outside of the area if we need to, to look for them. So as you look at our team, uh, we right now have 37 people that we have hired uh, since uh, I've become dean, basically, uh, in this process. And so we're continuing to grow. I've got like three more people that are going to join us next month, um, a couple, couple of faculty and then one staff member. So as we have need, we are beginning to to focus our hiring around that need. The biggest need in the first year here has been to develop our curriculum. So when you talk about the buildings, it's nice where people look at it, but you know what really has drawn people here is the vision of what we're trying to do. The asset of the, the facilities really just makes it very comfortable. People know that the location, these facilities are going to be great to recruit people in the future, including uh, the students uh, that are going to be interested in wanting to come into our area, they're going to just love these these facilities for us. But the team is really what this is all about. They are the ones that are putting the curriculum now together with me. So talk about the students a little bit. So you've progressed fairly quick through the LCME process. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you in that process, and when do you get to start recruiting students? Well, the first thing about accreditation that uh, I'll start at the end point is that you cannot recruit students and we'd love to do that because we all, you know, my dream team, in a sense, as you call it, um, my faculty love to talk to people. They want they, they want to begin that process. But we cannot do that until we get accredited. So the accreditation process is pretty long and arduous. And part of the reason that it is is, is that the LCME, the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, LCME, um, basically only meets three times a year. So... Wherever you are in the queue of doing things, you cannot rush their process. The second is, is that we have standards that we have to meet, just like all health professions do. And we've gone through that process, working very hard to meet those standards. Um, all, that's why I've hired who I've hired. I've got some very quality people that have done some great things for us to prepare us to address those standards. And so once we've done that, we were then granted at some point in this entire process what they call a site visit. Uh, when you get a site visit, uh, basically you are now moved from a, an applicant to a candidate school. And so right now, uh, we, Roseman, and UNLV both are, are candidate schools. UNLV is awaiting for their site visit, and we just had our site visit in February. 
What is important about those site visits, so you know, is is that they do not tell you any recommendations at that point when it comes to what, what is going to happen because they take the information, that small team that comes and represents the LCME, takes it to the large national body of the LCME, and they will review the information from Rosamond in their June meeting. At that June meeting, that's when we will hear. Uh, I'll get a phone call that will tell us uh, which way we're going as far as the process. So once accredited, then that's when we would start to do the very first recruitment, which is very obvious and very, very intentional and and exciting. (laughs) So what does that student base look like? If you had to define the uh, demographic profiling, we aren't supposed to to do that kind of stuff. But if we were to define what that student base looked like, what does that look like to you? Well, what we're hoping, and and we're developing, uh, and we have been developing, our admissions criteria. I believe that admissions criteria are very critical to get the right students. So as I mentioned the values earlier, um, those values are the things that I use to hire every person. I basically look at them through the lens of those values. We're creating criteria for our students around the values as well. So those particular criteria will be the lens that we look at each student. So when you look at the different things there, we want students that are basically committed to the community, Mm -hmm. that are diverse, that are respectful among one another, basically, as well as with the other health professions. You know, we hear of stories where the professions sometimes don't work well together, but it's going to be our intent to bring on people that really can work well together, and we will do what we call the interprofessional working across and, and with other professions as we work forward. So when you look at the demographics, one of my goals as we go through this over time, we are going to be looking at local talent. Basically, those that are in the southern Nevada region, that's one of my top priorities without a question, and across Nevada. Um, the, The challenge that we have is that we don't have a lot of students that are looking for going to medical school in Nevada. Last year, I think as I was looking at some data, I believe the number was like 269 students applied to an MD granting medical school. Um, and so that's not a large pool when you start to look at how large our, our classes are getting and not everybody gets in and those kind of things. So then not only from here, but then I would say if I'm looking for it, I'd be saying, what does our local community look like? So if you, you look at it, you know that we have a large Latino population, African-American. Uh, we have others from some of the uh, places like the Philippines and so forth that are here. And there's just lots of different pockets of of people all over that we definitely want to make sure that we have representation. So when I look at the demographics, I'm looking at trying to represent the different cultures and races as much as we can, because that's the ultimate goal is to be able to bring practitioners on that are very similar to the cultures and races. That's amazing. So you were in the studio earlier uh, to film a little shot for the Clark County Medical Society Alliance. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of work that we've been working towards with Las Vegas Hills, what we call the Eds and Meds Initiative. Tell us a little bit uh, about, we've been doing a Dean's Dinner for the last year. What's your experience been from that? And has that been of value to the uh, College of Medicine? Well, one thing that I would say, and this even predates those conversations, is that I've always appreciated the relationship that I've had with you, Doug, as well as Heels, um, and all the work and effort that's been there. Very welcoming, um, also very informing. Yeah, that's one of the things I said in one of my earlier statements. It's very important to understand the community before you really start to say, what do we think we should be doing here? And we need not only other people's input, but also their involvement. And so by you stepping up and really being uh, one that's been, say, welcoming with open arms, it's been very, very helpful. It's led into a lot of great things. As we talked about, one of the things was the GME task force that came out of some of the hard work, and we're looking at some great things that are going to happen with GME, which we can talk about if you'd like. But it also then led into some of the other things that you are doing, uh, bringing the deans together. And it's always been my premise, I shared this at one of the first times that we got together with deans, is that we used to meet on a regular basis in the state of Ohio, the deans from all the, the, the colleges. We had private, we had DO, and we had MD, all different kinds of medical schools. And what was very helpful is because we began to look at uh, the landscape together and say, how do we make a difference in this community? Especially when you have limited resources. Sure. And you look at how do we do this better? Because sometimes we're struggling with certain things or not. Those deans meetings that we're having now with you uh, that, that kind of have been an outreach have been helpful to get to know the other players, uh, and I've, I've grown a lot of affection for the, the different individuals. 
Uh, Tom Schwenk has not been as much a part of that because he's been more involved in the uh, the North, but I've met with Tom and I've had a great time with him. I've met with Mitch Foreman on a regular basis as well in the past, just talking with him at a variety of meetings. Um, obviously, then the, the other important thing that I would want uh, others to know is, is that Barbara Anketz and I uh, get along very well. And we talk about, um, you know, how do you grow a new school? I mean, that's one of the fun things that we're both doing. There's lots of challenges. But ultimately, how do we do things together for the betterment of this this uh, community, whether it be for quality health care or uh, quality education, all different kinds of ways. And I think that those particular events have helped us to strengthen our partnership. You bet. So these students get out in four or five years now. Uh, they're going to move into graduate medical education. Share a little bit of your experiences with the GME task force and uh, some of your expectations or hopes to come out of that. Well, the first thing that I would say is is that um, I was very heartened and, and just I just thought it was very thoughtful that this whole process focused on the state uh, stepping up to do some things. Um, and, and there was a grassroots effort. A lot of people came together, not only from the medical school's perspective, but hospitals and other kind of businesses. And so when that GME task force, um, the first one that was set up, uh, by the governor, it basically looked at well, what do we do and how do we do it. So a lot of great conversations. So I got a chance to meet a lot of great people, learn about different perspectives. Um, and so as we went from that particular one and, and the $10 million were approved in the biennial budget through the governor's work and through the, uh, you know, the senators and, and the assembly, uh, we we're very grateful for that. So now there's a second task force uh, that is being chaired by Vance uh, Farrow. Uh, that group is basically, again, bringing some of the key players in hospitals and medical schools together and others to kind of talk about what does it look like to apply for those dollars so that those particular institutions can get some of what we call the seed money to start a residency training. Uh, point is, is that when you talk about $10 million over a two-year budget, a lot of people recognize that that's not a lot of money technically. It is a lot of money, but when you're starting, uh, say, a residency program at the very beginning, it may take you up to about two to two and a half million dollars in the first couple of years to just begin the process, but then you have ongoing costs and so forth. But I think that those, uh, you know, those task forces are really critical to help us as we keep moving forward with uh, GME and residency training. What do you feel the next big challenge is for the region? So we've, you know, we're, we're building this pipeline of uh, medical students. Uh, we're going to have graduate medical education that they fall into. What's the next step? Is it a fellowship-based program, or do we need to work backwards, per se, into the K-12 to to get the the applicant pipeline a bit, little bit mm-hmm. bigger? You, you, you probably spend a lot of time thinking about that. Tell us your thoughts. Pipeline is very important, you know, whether you're on the beginning of the pipeline all the way through medical school and after. It's kind of like you want to do it well. So I think that part of it is, and I'm very grateful for what our legislature legislators did this past uh, biennial budget, is where they focused on the K through 12 education. Um, I hear that from a lot of families that uh, they're very pleased with that focus because uh, there needed to be more focus. Um, the hope is is that it will raise the level of some of the uh, the educational needs that we have, uh, and and uh, help us to have better outcomes in some of the things. Uh, point being is is that that needs to, that needs to be strengthened. We know that we at Roseman are planning on developing pipelines with our various schools, the public system, private high schools. There's also Magnet. And I've met with all different players in all of those to talk with uh, the leaders there to understand first of all what our pipelines look like. And so is because I can look at any of those schools, no matter where they are, and say there's got to be someone in one of those schools that wants the dream of becoming a physician, and we want to help them get there. So when we make that pipeline connections, some of this is developing programs to connect. We then want to get them into medical school, and so we have to keep developing that process. Um, when you're asking about you know, one of the, the major things uh, that I think is facing us in this region, uh, I would just, if I could just add one other thing to that, I think it has to do more with the health care delivery, and that's about uh, reimbursements. Uh, one of the challenges that all the deans will have, and, and uh, I think businesses, is to recruit people here. Um, you need to make sure that you have a very uh, high-level quality health care system um, that also makes it, I think, a very good place for our physicians to work. And reimbursements have been a challenge. That's what I've heard. And I think that what we need to do is explore that more. 
We need to learn more about that particular thing because that's the other end of the pipeline. That's recruitment. And not only is it recruiting people, because you're not going to recruit if you don't have good reimbursements. It's going to be tough. And then to retain is the other thing because to have people that have established practices and to grow or to grow other businesses, it's very difficult if you don't have that. Yeah, we're, we're looking at the reimbursements conversation right now. We started a conversation back in October, and uh, it's, it's interesting because the uh, physician profession is the only place where we deliver our services first and then negotiate what we're going to get paid next. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've got to we've got to get that right because uh, between Roseman, UNLV, Tor, everybody's building this great pipeline of future uh, physician workforce, but if we don't get them paid uh, properly. We're going to have some retention issues. Absolutely. So we're coming to an end. I want to thank you for being on the set here at Inside Medicine. Uh, and for those of uh, that are online with us, if you want to tell them how you can, uh, how they can get in contact with you, that'd be wonderful. Well, thank you, Doug. And thank you for this time. Uh, the way that we would do this is you know, contact us through the Roseman.edu site, Roseman.edu. And that would take you to the website. And uh, I think it's on the hair behind me here. And then if you could go to the programs on there, you'll go down to where it says College of Medicine. You go specifically to that uh, bullet point and then press on that, and that'll bring up information about the College of Medicine. Um, people that would like to get in touch with the College of Medicine, if uh, they want to talk or have me talk to different groups or to share more information with them, they can reach me at mpen at roseman.edu, mpen at roseman.edu. And the phone number that I can be reached at is 702-802-2832, 702-802-2832. Dr. Penn, again, thank you for joining us on the set of Inside Medicine, and we look forward to having you back on the set soon. All right. Well, thank you, Doug. Great to be here.